Hello, this is Tom Repass of Canyon Rim Honeybees. Welcome to my series of videos, Introduction to Beekeeping. This presentation is about honeybee diseases and parasites. This presentation is meant to be a basic overview and review of honeybee diseases and parasites and how one might identify, diagnose, and manage them. Some of these topics are so important that I have more intermediate to advanced presentations about them separately, including Varroa mites as well as Nozema serranii. It's important for you to be able to recognize various problems that come up with your hives over time and how to address them before they get out of hand and perhaps even result in the loss of your colony itself. Sometimes it can be difficult to recognize or identify these, so I, I do encourage you as a new beekeeper, if you have any questions or you're not sure, to ask a more experienced beekeeper, uh, master beekeeper, or for that matter, your state beekeeper, to help you uh, identify and diagnose some of these uh, conditions that your hives might get. Now, I don't want to be too uh, negative or depressing. Uh, you know, Keeping bees is one of the most amazing, fun, and rewarding things you can do, uh, but you also know how to take care of them so that they are healthy and successful and survive uh, instead of having them die and or uh, get sick and infect some of your neighbors hives. Well, Let's talk about brood diseases first. And there are although there are other ones I'm, I'm not really going to cover here such as sac brood and, and some of these others because they're less common the main three that as a beginning beekeeper you need to be aware of and know about are chalk brood uh, European fowl brood and American fowl brood. Chalk brood is a fungal disease caused by Ascophaera apis. It usually is a disease of stress, uh, typically early spring, early summer, often during rainy weather, cold weather. It's fairly easy to diagnose because you'll see these mummies that look like chalk. Uh, the bees will remove them. Sometimes you'll see them in the cells of the hive themselves. Usually they're not severe enough to cause the hive itself to die, uh, but uh, they can cause your hive to be weakened as the uh, colony can lose a lot of the brood during these times. And here's some photos of what chalk brood looks like in the hive and then some of the mummies that you might see thrown out of the front of the hive as the bees attempt to clean it out of the brood nest. Unfortunately, there's no approved treatment for chalk brood. I know uh, thyme hall has been reported to be effective. Uh, others have been researching uh, other things, such as lysozyme, which is an enzyme typically used uh, for bacteria. So I'm not sure how it would be uh, working for chalk brood, but neither of those are approved to be used for ch a chalk brood treatment uh, and should be considered experimental or something to be researched. The main cause of chalk brood is stress. So if your bees are under stress, such as in the early springtime, you might think about just feeding them some protein supplement or syrup. Try to avoid sharing combs of, uh, with chalk brood between other hives because you'll simply spread it. Excessive humidity or moisture might uh, encourage this to happen. After all, it is a fungus. And then some strains of bees that have hygienic behavior can uh, minimize or eliminate chalk brood, sometimes completely. So one of the things you can do is requeen and then if you have access to hygienic bees, consider requeening with bees that have this uh, genetic trait. European fallow brood is fairly common, and it often occurs uh, around the same, under the same conditions as does chalk brood, although interestingly, I rarely see both chalk brood and European fallow brood in the same colony. Uh, it's caused by a bacteria, Melissococcus pluton, but it, there's actually a, a group of bacteria associated with EFB, uh, the larvae are most susceptible when they are less than 48 hours old, and they usually die uh, before they are capped. And that's a very important thing to distinguish before uh, between uh, American fowl brood. American fowl brood tends to happen after the uh, brood has been capped, whereas European fowl brood occurs before. Uh, some of the contributing factors are poor nutrition and stress. Uh, so if it is a time of the year where there is not enough floral resources or it's cold rainy weather, such as spring, you might consider feeding your hives. The larvae first turn yellow and then brown in color, and thus it's most common in early spring, but sometimes other times of the year too, such as uh, autumn. The larvae die in twisted shapes. Uh, they die before they're capped, often turning yellowish or brown before they die. 
it can have an odor, but it's not the really foul carrion smell that you might get from American fallow brood. It can sometimes overlap or look very similar to parasitic mite syndrome, which is what happens to the brood uh, when there's a high varroa mite load. Uh, it, it can weaken the hive, but rarely will kill hives. Typically what it'll do is reduce the brood uh, and then reduce the population. So maybe the hive is weak enough such that it, it doesn't uh, really make much honey that year. Uh, the dead brood is loose and easily removed. It's not sticky. It doesn't stretch when you poke it with a stick or a matchstick. Uh, unlike American fallow brood, they die, the larvae die before they're capped. And it does not form long-lasting spores. They may be present for several weeks or several months, but unlike American fallow brood, it's not going to be in the comb for years or decades. Uh, so you don't really ha necessarily have to de destroy or burn the comb like you would if it was American fallow brood. And here's a photo of a... Uh, of some what a, a frame of European fallow brood might look like. You can see some larvae that look fairly healthy at first glance, but then you see other ones that are a little bit yellowish, a little uh, some of them start coiling or turning, and then some of them just form like a sort of a a paste almost. Important thing is you can poke it or mix it around with a stick and it does not rope out or stretch out like American fallow brood, which I'll show you photos of that here in a moment. So the main thing uh, to minimize a European fallow brood is avoid nutritional and other stress. So consider protein supplements. Try to avoid moving infected combs around your to other hives because you could spread it. Hygienic genetics can also help this as, because the bees are more, effect, uh, more aggressive at cleaning out the sick or dead brood. And if necessary, you can use antibiotics, either tericin or tylosin. Uh, in the U.S., you will require a prescription from a veterinarian uh, to get uh, these antibiotics. So they might require you to bring in photos or a sample of the brood comb just to prove that you're dealing with uh, EFB and not something else. American fallow brood, it's, it's one of the most dreaded brood diseases. And a lot of the newer beekeepers really don't, you know, have an understanding of this. And it, it does worry me, you know, as, as a lot of the state uh, APRS programs are not as well funded as they were, you know, decades ago. So we don't have state beekeepers doing as, as diligent of infections, or they're simply not available in some states. Uh, some beekeepers used to feed antibiotics uh, just regularly, twice a year, to manage that. But the problem is it simply put the American fowl brood, uh, it suppressed it but didn't take it away. So it was still existing in some of these old combs. And now that antibiotics are a little bit harder to get, as they should be, because American fowl brood became resistant to the antibiotics, over the past years and decades. Now we may see more of this coming that more than we've even seen for many years. Uh, the cause is Pyenobacillus uh, larvae. Uh, young larvae basically ingest or fed the, the spores by the nurse bees. The larva die as a pupa. So that's one thing that's different than, uh, than European fowlbird where the larva dies before it pupates and is capped. It is liquefied uh, by the bacteria, it dries, and eventually it becomes a very difficult, if not impossible, to move scale from the comb. And the odor is very foul. It's like something rotting, like rotten meat or something dead. Uh, and they will remain infectious in old comb for many decades. So one method to test while out in the bee yard is to use the rope test. You put a toothpick or matchstick into the cell, stir it, and try to draw it out. And if it ropes out more than a one inch or more, uh, it's most it's most likely to be American fowl brood. European fowl brood can rope out a tiny bit, but nowhere near as long or stretchy as as the uh, American fowl brood would be. And there are commercial available test kits, and so I have these available uh, just in case. Occasionally, new beekeepers uh, ask me to uh, you know I, I, I'm mentoring them or teaching them, and they ask me to uh, you know stop by and help with a diagnosis of what might be going on with a hive. So I carry some of these test kits with me. So some of the characteristics of American fowl brood, uh, some of them overlap with other types of brood diseases, but the last three with the little asterisk are the ones that are unique to American fowl brood. So spotty irregular brood pattern, we can see that in a lot of type of brood diseases, even in parasitic mite syndrome. Sunken cappings, holes in the cappings, you can see that again in, in, mite, uh, in parasitic mite syndrome. Uh, difficult to remove scale, very foul order, those are fairly specific for American fowl brood. But the rope test, where you stretch it out with a toothpick, the caramel color of the dead pupa in the capped brood, and then the pupal tongue that stretches out, those are all unique to American fowl brood. And here's a photo.
of what a foul brood frame may look like. You know, the one on the left, you know, with the holes in the cappings, that's harder to tell just looking at it. You're going to have to look more closely. And then you might see some of these brown pupa. Here's some of the cell cap that were open and sunken. But again, you can sometimes see that in other types of brood diseases. So if you see something like this, you have you must look cl more closely to determine, is this American fowl brood or is it something else? And here's a, a photo of the dead pupa with the tongue outstretched. So that's fairly specific for American fowl brood. Here's photos of what the scales may look like. They're, they're Once they dry, they're difficult, if not impossible, to remove. They just are stuck to the side of the cell. And then here's a photo of what roping from American fowl brood might look like. It stretches out, like I said, a couple of centimeters, an inch. Again, stretching way out. And another photo. So European fowl brood, it, it might stretch, you know, a little bit, but not even not even half as much as this. Well, the most important thing is avoid uh, transferring infected combs to other hives. Uh, don't let a, a fowl brood hive that has died out or weakened get robbed out by other colonies because they'll simply take the fowl brood to their hives. Don't use contaminated equipment. You know, occasionally things come up for sale. Uh, you maybe an older beekeeper is retiring, or maybe a family found, you know, the, the the beekeeper has is deceased, and the family found all this equipment in a barn somewhere, doesn't know what to do with it, so they they think they're doing you a favor by giving you a good deal on it, and you don't know the history of that equipment, and it might be infected with American fowl brood. You might bring something home that you'll have to deal with for years, um, and then you can quote control uh, this disease with antibiotics, but I want to be clear, you're not going to cure it. Uh, and that's part of the problem. A lot of the American fowl bird is actually resistant to antibiotics because it was overused. They used it as a, you know, a twice a year treatment and it resulted in the fowl bird no longer responding to the antibiotics. So really the only situation where I might use antibiotics if I was faced with American fowl bird is, let's say I have one colony in my beer yard that, that has American fowl brood. But as far as I know, none of the others in that location have any evidence of it. So what I would do is is feed those other colonies antibiotics and just in case they happen to bring anything back from that other hive um, to kind of control it. And then that original hive that's destroyed uh, that, or that the fowl bird is affected, I probably would end up destroying the hive and the equipment, which sounds harsh. But if you think about how infectious this disease is and how difficult it is to eradicate, sometimes you need to do that. And then, of course, after that hive uh, and the bees themselves were were uh, destroyed, I would watch all of the other hives in that uh, that apiary uh, for the next several months and even into the next year for any signs whatsoever of American fowl brood. Um, if if it happened in just that one hive and none of the other hives robbed it out, um, you know maybe you will have gotten lucky and and it will not have affected any of the other hives. Of course, if other hives begin showing signs of American fowl bird, you're going to have to ask yourself, you know, do you try to, you know, destroy the few that have signs or symptoms, or are you going to do the whole yard? Um, and this can be a very difficult decision, uh, and honestly, even a de devastating decision, you know, if it's a severe and widespread in your bee yard. It's just one of the most terrible things to see. You know, I remember when I was... Uh, much younger, there was an older beekeeper whose uh, hives had been affected with American fowl brood, and they had to dig a hole, uh, you know, in the back with with their with their backhoe, and put all the bees all, and all the all the equipment, and basically have a big bonfire to burn it, and then cover everything. Um, it, it's it's heartbreaking, uh, and it does worry me that a lot of new beekeepers don't really think that American fowl brood is really anything to worry about. It hasn't been that much of an issue over the past decades, primarily because we've had very aggressive honeybee inspection programs by the state apiarists. And with the decreased funding uh, in, in agriculture and specifically in the state bee inspection programs of many states, I, I would not be surprised if we begin seeing more of this uh, over the next uh, coming years and decades, which I hope I'm wrong. But, um, you know, I have heard stories of new beekeepers buying nukes from a nuke cellar and they were infected with uh, with American fowl brood and they had to be completely destroyed. You know, what a sad and devastating way to start out your beekeeping uh, career, uh, but by getting hives that ended up having to be destroyed because they were infected with AFB. Okay, the next uh, set of uh, diseases we'll discuss are the gut diseases.
And these are basically Nozema and then Dysentery. Now, some of the bee books and even some beekeepers get these confused and they think they're the same thing, but they, they most certainly are not. Uh, dysentery is really more of a symptom uh, and it can be caused by multiple things, whereas Nozema is a very specific uh, parasite, fungal parasite that can affect bees. There are two species of Nozema, and for many years the only type we had was Nozema apis, and it tends to occur, tended to occur in late winter and early spring, usually after the bees were confined and weren't able to go out and fly and, and go to the bathroom. But more recently, Nozema serranii has come into the U.S., and in many locations it has entirely replaced uh, the, the Nozema apis. Nozema serranii came in from a related type of honeybee, uh, Apis serrana from Asia and transferred over to the European honeybee. Although there are similarities, there are differences as well. Uh, you can sometimes see Nozema apis associated with dis dysentery um, because they occur under the same circumstances, but Nozema apis probably doesn't cause dysentery by itself. So all those photos you see online or in the bee books, you know, with the, the fecal spotting, the poop spots on the hive saying, oh, that's Nozema. That may not be true, and, and it is true if they have dysentery and they have nozema, that the pooping uh, can spread the nozema throughout the hive, and as the house bees come and clean it, then the nozema can be spread that way. But it, it, many times, colonies can have nozema without any symptoms whatsoever. Um, the nozema apis can cause reduced brood production and honey production, increased winter mortality, and colony dwindling, but it usually didn't completely kill the colonies. Now, Nozema serranii, uh, this is a, often asymptomatic uh, because it occurs in, in the other times of the season um, and in the spring and the summer. You probably you might not even really think that it's a, a possibility. And that's one of the things that's really uh, nefarious about Nozema serranii is it can sneak up on you. And it can do all the things that Nozema apis can do, but it can also end up just killing the colony off completely. And, and it's striking how fast this can happen. Uh, you can have a colony that's full of bees looking great and only a month later they can be completely gone. And it's been theorized that Nozema serranii may be one of the causes of what we used to call colony collapse disorder. Now you can look at the uh, uh, bee under the microscope. This is a dissected bee and there can be inflammation in the gut that can suggest there may be Nozema. Um, however, this diagnosis is not perfect and so sometimes you can have a colony of bees that are, is infected with Nozema and it is inconsistent as to whether or not uh, looking at a, a gross dissection like this will be able to tell you whether they have it. The only way to really diagnose is it is under the slide under a microscope and look for the Nozema spores themselves. For years we have used fumagillins in syrup and we would feed the medicated syrup in the fall to minimize infections over the winter uh, Nozema serranii, however, might be coming more resistant to fumagillin, um, or even if it does respond, it uh, may uh, uh, may actually rebound afterwards. Uh, in Europe, thymolated syrup has been studied with mixed results. So when I first uh, made this presentation, fumagillin was not available for a couple of years, but fortunately it, it is available again now um, as of the year 2021. Um, it really is the only treatment that has been shown to be effective, but it is not legal in many countries because even though it can be effective for treatment of nozema in honeybees, it, it may have toxicity to mammalian cells and has been detected in the honey. If a beekeeper, for example, fed sugar syrup with fumagillin and they were not careful and then the bees put honey into the cells where the sugar syrup was already, you could get fumagillin within the honey itself and obviously that's something you want to completely avoid. Now, dysentery uh, is another uh, gut disease, but I think of it more of a symptom rather than disease. Sure, it can be seen with Nozema apis, but you can have uh, it from other causes. There's a uh, honeybee amoeba biasis. Uh, if it's poor quality food, for example, in some places, the fall honey flow is dark, high residue honey. And uh, if the bees can't fly out to go poop, they can get uh, dysentery from that. Uh, if the syrup uh, is fed, but they don't have a time to ripen it, it can start fermenting in the hive, and that can also cause the bees to get dysentery. Um, basically, I think of it as, you know, honeybee diarrhea. And the, really, the only way to distinguish between dysentery and nozema is, is via microscopy. That's the only way. 
Here's a photo of dysentery in the hive. So basically bee poop on the outside of the hive or even on the inside of the hive. Uh, and again, although you can see this in association with nosema, it is quite possible uh, to have it without. And in fact, most of the cases of nosema that I diagnose in my own uh, colonies does not have fecal spotting. Uh, so when I see this, it's like it doesn't mean it's nosema. Basically, in order to diagnose it, you have to look at it under the microscope. I have a whole other presentation about nosema uh, that I will uh, will uh, upload to YouTube for, uh, later on, and it goes through in great detail how to make a diagnosis via microscopy, uh, more detail into what some of the treatment options are. Uh, fumagillin is now available again, um, but you know it's been used for so many years that we really need to start thinking about other treatment options and, and look into some of those. So just to summarize nosema and dysentery. Not all dysentery is due to nosema, but they often have the same uh, predisposing factors. Poor nutrition, lack of winter cl cleansing flights. You can't really control that if it's a cold winter and the, it just lots of week after week of, of cold weather. The bees are cooped up in the hive and they just can't go out to poop. You don't have much control about over that. Uh, excess humidity in the hive, uh, other stressors. So feeding syrup and protein supplement and putting bee yards in warm, sunny, dry locations, especially where it'll be sunnier and warmer during the winter, might help minimize uh, the chances of either nosema or no dysentery uh, happening. Well, the next uh, part of this presentation is mites. Um, and I have to admit, I'm not alone among beekeepers uh, when I say I absolutely despise these little creatures. There are two types of mites, tracheal and varroa. Uh, tracheal mites really have, have gone away. Uh, we were very fortunate when tracheal mites first came that we were able to breed resistance to them actually rather easily. Uh, so we hardly ever see tracheal mites anymore, but I'm still mentioning them for informational and historical purposes. And you never know, something could change and maybe there could be some new virulent form coming back or whatnot. But the main mite that we really focus on in treating now are the varroa mites. Uh, but I will discuss tracheal mites briefly, uh, just so that you understand what they are. So the first mite that came to the U.S. were the tracheal mites. Uh, they live within the breathing tubes of adult honeybees. So honeybees don't have, uh, you know, lungs the way that you know a, a human or a mammal do. They have these tracheal tubes that come in through the sides of the the thorax, and that's how uh, the, how they get oxygen. And the mites can actually move into there. Uh, and cause the bees to become weak and eventually uh, die at a younger age. It's more likely during times of the year when the bees are cooped up, so autumn and winter. And the only way to really diagnose them is through uh, microscopy. Uh, you have to look at them under the microscope. There's other signs that uh, have been suggested to suggest tracheal mites, such as seeing weak bees crawling outside the hive with the wing you know, not hooked together the way it should, but in the K-wing. But this is really nonspecific. A weak, sick bee can have K-wing for any reason, so it's not really, you know, very specific for diagnosing tracheal mites. And the only way is to do a dissection of the mites and look into the tracheae. You know, as part of my master beekeeping uh, certification, we learned how to do this. Uh, but I don't think any of us uh, even found any tracheal mites within our bees, even though we learned how to do the dissection. And, uh, you know, if I, something was happening with my bees and I didn't know what it was, I, I surely would go through and do with these dissections and look. But uh, the tracheal mites, we've been very fortunate to be able to uh, breed out, you know, resistance for them. Some of the treatments we are already using for varroa mites may actually help tracheal mites. So that might be another reason why there's less of them and, or maybe not, not really being seen. Uh, back in the day, uh, before we had any of these treatments, and even before varroa was around, we were using these grease patties. Uh, two cups sugar with one part vegetable shortening because basically the tracheal mites had difficulty finding the new young bees. Uh, but we don't even do, some of the bee books still mention these, but it's really out of date. You don't have to really use any of these treatments for, uh, for your honeybees as tracheal mites are really considered to be no longer a problem. Now this mite, Varroa, um, is definitely a problem. Uh, you know, I, I talk to new beekeepers all the time, and sometimes their hive dies or is weak, and they don't know why. And my first question is, was it mites? Did you treat for mites? Did you look for mites? 
And if the answer of any of those questions is no, then it's probably 90% sure that the hive died from Varroa. Now, not 100%. The hives can starve to death, and they can have a queen failure, or they can be affected and weakened by no uh, Nozema serranii. So there's plenty of other reasons for a hive to be lost. But probably the 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 times for a new beekeeper to lose a hive is due to not uh, monitoring and not treating or managing Varroa correctly. It's a problem because it originally was a, press, a pest of the Asian honeybee, uh, Apis serrana, and when it got transferred over and was able to re reproduce in the European honeybee, the European honeybees did not have genetic uh, behaviors or resistance, and it really changed beekeeping uh, after it has come into, uh, uh, into the area. You know, I remember the years before Varroa when, you know, keeping bees was relatively easy. You know, you made sure they had enough food. You made sure they had a healthy queen and you made sure they didn't starve. And, you know, it was it was so easy back then. It really was the good old days of beekeeping. But once uh, Varroa came in in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, beekeeping just very, very, very much changed. I mean, some sometimes, some years I feel like I'm not really a beekeeper, but I'm a Varroa mite manager. Uh, you've got to have a plan. It doesn't always have to in, in, in involve treatments or, or uh, you know, synthetic chemicals or whatnot. Um, there's a lot of integrated pest management techniques, IPM, that you can also use. But you have to be thinking about Varroa. You have to be doing things, you know, maybe requeening with mite tolerant strains of bees or whatnot. So the mites feed on larvae and honeybees, and they weaken the condition of the emergent honeybees, but they also transmit viral infections. So the bees don't always die from the mite itself, but sometimes from the viruses that end up weakening the colony. Uh, and often the colony will die within a few years. So I, I, there's some new beekeepers, you know, they've been keeping bees for two or three years, and, oh, I'm treatment-free, and I haven't lost a hive yet. Uh, well, what often happens is they maybe bought their colonies from a beekeeper who had treated the hives and the mite population was low, and it just hasn't had a chance to build up enough in order for them to start losing hives. And so this is just another slide, you know, from the Honey Bee uh, Coalition. Uh, ignorance is definitely not bliss. Pretending that you do not have a Varroa problem because you didn't see any uh, you know, that's just really being, you know, neglectful. Um, and it's just, you know, unless you live in Australia or somewhere where there aren't any Varroa mites yet, uh, or a few isolated islands, um, you're going to lose bees. So here's a, a photo looking at what brood should look like in the spring and summer. It should be healthy. You know, there shouldn't be any open spots. There shouldn't be any dead brood. If you have a colony that's highly affected with uh, mites, you can see this, which we call parasitic mite syndrome, uh, where some of the pupae are opened. And it, it can kind of resemble chalkroot if you're not looking at it, you know, very closely, or even it can resemble uh, European fallow brood. So this is where you really have to be looking at it more closely. Sometimes you can see uh, mites on the bees themselves, but much of the time they're not going to be on the dorsal outer surface of the bee, but on the ventral surface towards the comb. So just looking at your bees, you're not going to necessarily see mites unless you take them out of the hive and you, you, know, you do a, a mite wash. Here's a poor little bee uh, affected by uh, deformed uh, wing virus. Uh, you know, and this bee is going to die. Uh, you know, she had a mite in her um, when she was a pupa and then viruses was spread. Some types of bees will actually pull out the pupa. The, the bees that have uh, varroa-specific hygiene will, will know and actually uh, pull out the, the pupa and sacrifice it along with the mite. Here's another photo of a poor bee um, that had been affected by the deformed wing virus. I, I, get, I get calls like this so many times, so many times. Uh, you know, I can't even remember. You know, a new beekeeper, our hive died. Why did it die? We're so sad. Can you help us figure it out? And I respond, and like, uh, you know, many experienced beekeepers, you know, did you treat for mites? Did you look for mites? Uh, and they're like, no, we didn't see any. Well, most likely it was mites. And they're like, oh, no, it couldn't have been. And, you know, if you're in denial about this, it's inevitable almost that you're going to continue to um, lose hives until you get a handle on this. You know, did you do a mite count? Did you treat for mites? How do you know that you, you didn't have any mites? Well, we didn't treat, we didn't see any, but here's some photos of, of our dead bees. What do you think? And this was uh, sent to me all on a cell phone, so I didn't even have to drive out to look at the bee. 
and already I knew even before they did that you know why their hive why their hive died. You know here's a, a cluster of the bees that were left. They were obviously weakened, and you can see some dysentery on that too. Um, it doesn't mean that the dysentery uh, was the cause of the hive dying, uh, but any time a colony is under stress, they can start having that the bee diarrhea. And looking more closely on these cell phone photos, I said, well, your hive definitely did died of mites. And they're like, well, how, you, we didn't see it. And I sent it right back. Well, here they are. There's the little red circles. There's a mite there and a mite there and a mite there. Up here, I enlarged it. There's a dead mite. Oh, here's another couple of dead mites. There's another one. So, you know, these mites don't have to be, they're not that obvious. I mean, you can see them with the naked eye, but they're only the size of a pin. And even if you didn't see them, you know, they, they often hide out. They're under the undersurface of the bee. So if you look at a comb of bees and you can see mites crawling around on the bees themselves, that hive is probably already in trouble because that means there's so many of them that they're actually crawling around, not just on the undersurface, but all over the bee. And also during the breeding season, you know, just remember 80 to 90% of the mites are in the brood and only about 10% are on the bees themselves. And most of them are under on the undersurface and they latch on. So you're you're not likely to see them crawling around on the bee, you know, just by glancing at your bees. Here's a slide from Dr. Megan Milbraith. Uh, and it's basically what happens with new many new beekeepers. Um, you know, the first year they lose 50 to 100 percent of their bees. Uh, and they 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 kind of hope things are gonna be better and they don't change in what they do or, or how they treat. The next year they lose 50 to 100% of their bees, and then by year three they lose 50 to 100% of the bees, and usually by year four or five they either quit beekeeping because it's too hard and expensive, or they take varroa seriously and they begin taking action um, to prevent their hives from being lost. There's different ways to monitor for varroa. Um, you can simply look uh, at the bottom board to see how many bee mites drop, but it doesn't really tell you the percent infestation. It just tells you that there's mites there. Um, so mite drop on a screen board isn't really that reliable. Uh, although I do admit, if I treated a hive and I come back and I see all those dead mites on the bottom board, I, I love seeing those dead mites. Um, what, you know, what can I say? Uh, you can also cut open the brood and look at that. And the drone, the, the mites preferentially go to the drone brood because it, it takes a few days longer to develop. And that allows them to raise a few more uh, baby mites by being in the drone brood over the worker brood. But if you see like a comb full of mites like that uh, photo there, that, that hive has probably got some serious problems also. And then on adult bees, you can do a, a, a mite count through either alcohol wash, powder sugar, um, ether, or soapy water. And you know, when you do when you do the mite washes, you do end up killing a, you know, a few hundred bees in that process. But I look at it, those bees are sacrificing themselves, or you're sacrificing them, uh, in for, in, for the greater good of that hive. So if by doing a mite wash, I know that that hive has problems and I need to treat, I might be able to save that hive uh, as compared to not monitoring mites and not looking um, and not finding that the colony um, you know, has a very high mite load. You know, so looking at, at the different methods of, of uh, monitoring for mites, you know, mite drop is the easiest, uh, less time consuming, but if you want a more accurate estimation of colony population, uh, then you would use a, a mite wash technique. You know, looking at the brood, that's kind of in between. And there's many ways to uh, to treat a varroa, and some of them, you know, are more cultural. You know, you know how you raise them, uh, drone brood, brood removal. Uh, you know what what type of bees you raise, and then once you get into a situation where, you know, the the there's a higher mite load, you might want to use maybe some of the organic treatments like formic acid, oxalic acid, or even thymol. Um, or if it's a severe problem, you might want to use maybe a synthetic treatment. Um, you know, like amitraz or something like that. But it should not downplay integrated pest management, even though it may not be quite enough to completely control mites, that it can at least perhaps minimize how often you need to treat. So some of the more effective methods are removing the drone brood from the hive, freezing the comb so that the uh, drone brood uh, is killed along with the mites, and then putting it back. Uh, brood breaks, requeening with uh, mite-resistant stock, these can all be really relatively effective. You know, other things, like some beekeepers would treat the whole hive with powdered sugar, but that really was proven to not be that effective. Uh, screen bottom boards, a lot of us were using those uh, 
quite commonly, but usually if a mite has fallen down, she's not going to climb back up in the hive. She's pretty much done. So uh, that, that really hasn't been shown to have any effect in reducing mite population either. Here's a review of some of the mite treatments available. Um, and again, I have an entire presentation on Varroa mite monitoring, management, and treatment that goes into all of this in much more detail. This is more of a, of a brief, uh, a, a more brief um, overview. Uh, some treatments are temperature dependent. You cannot use them at a high temperature because you could have loss of brood or the queen. So the two that are uh, independent of temperature uh, include amitraz as apivar or the oxalic acid dribble or sublimation. Uh, some are allowed in the honey supers, and this is an older slide, but oxalic acid was recently allowed by the EPA to be used when honey supers were on. So uh, some of these treatments cannot be used it, during the honey flow because if you have honey supers on and you apply the treatment, uh, there's a chance that some of the treatments could get in the honey. And it's very important that we avoid this. Um, and so that's why some of these treatments are not allowed. And again, I, I should have changed the slide. The oxalic acid was recently uh, permitted by the, by the EPA to be allowed as a treatment during the honey flow. Um, so just there, so, so that, that's, uh, that one should actually be in the green category. And the cheapest treatment probably is oxalic acid, uh, especially uh, you know if you're using the dribble. You could invest in one of the vaporizers to sublimate that the oxalic acid. So there's some upfront costs, um, but the downside is that oxalic acid is not effective uh, if if there's any brood present. And some beekeepers might treat three, four, or five times, you know, every few days to try to manage that. But I find that sometimes that just isn't very effective. But oxalic acid is very effective in the in the middle of the winter when there is very little to no brood present. So the timing of treatments for Varroa. Well first you should do a sample and a, and a mite wash. Um, if there's very minimal uh, mites present you might be able to skip your spring treatment but if you're not sure you may want to do a treatment um, and then resample afterwards. Uh, then sample towards the end of the year where the mite might be a little bit higher um, and if necessary treat again. Uh, you want to treat early enough so that winter bees can be raised and are healthy, uh, so that they don't, uh, you know, they don't weaken the winter bees. One problem I see with new beekeepers uh, with varroa treatment is they treat, but they treat too late. They're not treating until, say, October, and by then many of the winter bees have been raised. And so what happens is you have a strong, healthy-looking colony, but it's full of mites. Those bees are weakened. You treat in October, but the, the damage has already been done. Those are dead bees walking. And so then the hive is dead by December or January. And the new beekeeper is like, well, I don't know what happened. I treated. Um, if temperatures permit, you should be treating you know, mid-August or early September in order to allow the hive to raise new, healthy bees that can survive through the winter. Um, that is probably one of my, my second most uh, important pieces of advice. Besides taking mites seriously, monitoring for them, and treating for them, um, the, the, the other second bit of advice is to, when you do treat in the late summer, make sure you do it early enough so that you will have healthy winter bees. And then finally, you can do another single treatment with oxalic acid, either with the dri drizzle um, or with the uh, sublimation. And this is a slide from uh, Randy Oliver, and you know what? Some folks ask me, what is my favorite treatment? And, you know, my answer is it depends. I don't use, uh, you know, the same treatment over and over again because I'm worried about, you know, developing some type of mite uh, resistance to some of those treatments. Well, enough about mites. And, again, I have a whole separate presentation that's about an hour about Varroa mites exclusively. Let's talk about insect pests. These are primarily wax moths and small hive beetles. Um, I suppose you could put other types of insects too, like uh, you know wasps or hornets trying to get into your hive or fight your bees. But usually, the amount of loss from those is very minimal compared to what either wax moths or small hive beetles can do. There are two species of wax moths: the greater wax moth and the lesser wax moth. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter what type you have, but they can both cause serious damage of the combs, especially in warm weather. Uh, if a hive is healthy and strong, it will not succumb to wax moths. Typically what happens is the hive is already weakened, let's say from uh, mites or something, and then the parts of the comb that the bees cannot cover and defend gets infected by the wax moth larva, eventually destroying it. It's a much more of a problem in southern warm climates as compared to up north. 
I store a lot of my comb outside during the winter so that it freezes and that minimizes them. Not that we don't have wax moths up north, but they really don't become a problem uh, in comb until, say, the mid to late summer. And so I, by that time, I try to have all of my comb uh, on beehives to prevent them from being attacked by wax moths. And this is a picture roughly of what a wax moth looks like. Really not anything, you know, that exciting. Just a, you know, innocuous looking brown moth. But the problem is once the it, the eggs are laid, the caterpillar, the larva can crawl through and eat the wax and and essentially destroy it. You know, at first it, it's, uh, you know, just some of these paths and tunnels to the comb. But then eventually you can see these pupa, uh, which they're often ate, eaten into uh, the woodenware. You can see a lot of the gnawed areas where the where this is, uh, and it can be a real problem. So to manage, uh, you know, prevention is best. The best place to store already drawn comb in the summer is on a colony of strong a strong colony of bees. In the winter, if you're up north, you can allow your drawn comb to freeze. If you're a backyard beekeeper and you only have a few hives, you could put the the combs into a freezer. But if you have to store the drawn comb off of colonies any length of time and you no, cannot allow them to freeze, you can use uh, moth crystals, not moth balls that you might use for your clothes, but specific moth crystals called paradichlorobenzene, which are available from beekeeping suppliers, uh, and then air it out for about 24 to 48 hours before putting back on the hives. Myself, I try to avoid it because uh, this compound is fat soluble, which means it could get into the wax and stay there long term. Um, but since I live uh, up here in South Dakota, I basically just store my, my boxes outside, you know, covered, of course, and sealed so the bees can't get in there and no mice can get in there. But the freezing and thawing that happens all winter uh, really does a fairly good job, at least over the winter and the off season, from keeping those combs from getting wax moths in them. And then there's a relatively newer insect. Uh, it's been around for a while now, but it certainly wasn't here when I started out as a kid back in the 80s. And it's the small hive beetle. It's mainly a problem in the moist, warm southern states. Uh, it's found all over. We even see them in South Dakota, but they're really not much of a problem. I mean, we know what they are. We see them. They're usually not really a, a problem until late summer. Um, but they can completely die by sliming the honey and the, um, and, and the brood and, and basically causing the, the comb to be completely unusable. They're not very large, um, but the problem is they lay lots and lots of eggs, and in a weak colony, they can basically slime the hive. You know, the, the, the larvae just basically crawl around, eat through the honey, and the and they, they produce slime. And then, uh, so in places like the south, uh, you know, or where you're having small mating nukes, they can overwhelm a hive. Uh, there are beetle traps. Uh, the pupa pupate in the ground underneath the hive, so some people put a pesticide in the ground. Um, obviously, you got to be careful so that doesn't actually, you know, the, somehow the bees get exposed to that. Uh, but here in, you know, where I live, they're really not a problem. Um, and they're not a problem in arid places, too. So, you know, I know beekeepers in Arizona, and they say, you know, we really don't have a problem there either because the ground is so dry that the, the hive beetles just don't have a chance to uh, reproduce as well as compared to the southeast, where not only are the temperatures warm, but they're also very humid. But the best protection is similar to wax moths, and it's a strong, healthy hive. So again, I, I did mention yellow jackets and wasps. They're usually not a problem. Stronger colonies can defend themselves. Uh, but weaker colonies and uh, nukes can sometimes be uh, attacked by them. Uh, I like to trap the queens in the spring. So yellow jackets and wasps winter as a mated queen. And if you trap them in the spring, every queen you catch is, is one colony, one yellow jacket nest that did not have a chance to develop. And then you can also reduce the entrance and use anti-robbing screens in the fall. Uh, and here's an example of some of the traps that we might use. I know in some parts of the country, like the Pacific Northwest, these can really be a problem and decimate colonies. But at least here in the Rockies and Great Plains, it does not seem to be uh, so much of an issue for us. And finally, there are mammalian predators. Uh, the most common are skunks, uh, bears, uh, if, if you have them where you live, and then mice. Skunks are a member of the mink and weasel family. Uh, they are insectivores and omnivores, and they, they do like to eat, eat insects. And some of what they do may be good. You know, they may dig up an ant's nest, for example, um, or even a yellow jacket's nest. But they, they will also go after your bees, and they might scratch in front of the hive all night long. 
So I, I've been working hives and they've been fine. And then the next day I go back and they're like, oh my gosh, you're totally defensive. And I look around, I see digging and scratch marks and the poor bees were fighting off skunks all night. So then here I show up, you know, not knowing that. And obviously they're still kind of worked up and well, you know, then that's that, then they kind of come after me. Um, so there's ways you can keep them away from the hive with, you know, putting the hives up so that they're a higher level, uh, putting nail boards or electric hives. And here's an example of what the skunk might be doing digging in front of the hive. And you can actually see sometimes the poop from the skunk with the bees, dead bees in it. Here's a little nail board that somebody created so that the skunk doesn't want to stand in front of the uh, hive, um, you know, because it'll prick its, uh, its uh, paws. One of the more devastating predators is bears. If you have bears in your area, you know, you need to put an electric fence or something because they will go through and destroy your hives and equipment. And even despite, uh, you know, Winnie the Pooh wanting honey, uh, you know, they're, they'll eat the honey, but they're really interested in the bees and the brood. Um, it's a good source of protein. Um, but obviously, if they're in your hives and not some wild colony, that, that can be devastating. So a lot of us who have uh, honeybee colonies in places where bears are will set up electric fence lines um, in order to discourage them. It's important that it, uh, you use an electric fence that's hot enough, uh, strong enough to dissuade a bear. And it's important to put the wires close together just so that, uh, you know, the, if a bear does get there, it's not going to be able to sneak through or short out the wire. And finally, rodents. They can uh, move up and chew through the, the entrance and get up in the hive. And in the winter, when the bees cannot break cluster, uh, they can do a lot of damage in the hive, making their nests, chewing up the frames. Um, and so what I do is I put a mouse guard on in early September and I leave on until the spring. And in some places that are out of the way, I just leave the mouse guard on all year round. And here's a picture of what a mouse nest in a hive might look like, or even this is even more devastating, where they basically destroyed all the comb and then the bees ended up dying. Now, sometimes the bees are successful and they end up killing off the mice. And you might find little skeletons in the hive um, where the bees tried to remove it and they couldn't, so they put propolis all over it. So, you know, sometimes they do successfully defend themselves against the mice. Here's a photo of different types of bee guards. You can just make these out of half-inch, uh, you know, uh, hardware cloth, or you can buy a more, you know, a, a commercially made one. It's important to have them stapled onto the front of the hive securely because some of the larger rodents like rats or squirrels will remove them. And finally, this comes to the conclusion of our presentation, Honeybee Diseases and Parasites. This is one of the more dis depressing presentations I have to give, and I don't really necessarily like or enjoy giving this presentation. Uh, but I, I, what I like less is when honeybee hives die unnecessarily. And a lot of new beekeepers get into beekeeping not realizing that, you know, to be a beekeeper, you need to keep the bees healthy. And you need to understand and pay attention to the, the things that can affect or kill your beehive. But again, not to, not to reiterate it, but if I have one piece of advice for new beekeepers above anything else is learn about Varroa. Learn how to monitor for them, how to manage them, how to treat for them. Because if you don't, you will lose hives. You know, wishful thinking is, is not going to be enough. Um, there's a lot of folks out there, you know, saying, oh, I do treatment-free beekeeping and natural beekeeping. Um, they often get new beekeepers down the wrong uh, path, and they end up losing a lot of hives before they realize that a lot of that is wishful thinking. Um, and to be sure, varroa management does not always involve, you know, treating with with synthetic mite treatments. Um, there are integrated pest management techniques. There are um, non-chemical treatments, such as brood breaks. Uh, there are mite tolerant strains you might use. So those are all viable options too. But you need to understand there might be a hive. Even the most mite tolerant hive, it can be overwhelmed by mites and you may still have to pull out a treatment and, and keep that hive from dying. The second most uh, common cause of, of honeybee loss from diseases and parasites is Nosema serranii. Uh, and it, it really is striking how suddenly the hive can just collapse without any obvious symptoms. The other two diseases that you probably will see are chalk brood and European fowl brood. Um, there aren't any specific treatments for those, although I guess you could use antibiotics for European fowl brood. But these are diseases of stress. So the best way to manage these are by avoiding nutritional stress, requiting with a, a young queen or with hygienic stock, but which most of the time will minimize or even completely eliminate those two diseases. 
And then the most devastating disease, which we don't see very often, thank goodness, is American fowl brood. And although antibiotics can control it, uh, sort of put it into hiding, it is not a cure. Um, so often we end up having to destroy the entire beehive through burning. Uh, there are ways to treat the comb and the equipment, such as uh, with a gamma radiation treatment. Um, but those really are not available in very many locations. Uh, so unfortunately, if you have American fowl brood, it really can be devastating. And, you know, before you go through the killing your hive off, you, you definitely need to report this to the state uh, beekeeper. It's required by state law in many uh, states. And also make sure they confirm that you do have American fowl brood and you're not destroying your bees and your comb. And, and you actually have something else that, you know, is not as devastating like European fowl brood or or a hive that has collapsed from varroa and has varroa, um, you know, has parasitic mite syndrome. Uh, so this is the, the end of my basic presentation on honeybees, diseases, and parasites. But I do have an entire presentation on varroa and then another uh, entire presentation on nozema because those two uh, issues are so important and uh, so difficult and challenging for many beekeepers to manage. Uh, thank you so much for watching this. I hope, hope this does not discourage you uh, from becoming a beekeeper. I just want you to have a, a better understanding about what you need to do so that you don't go and lose hives any more than, than you have to. Uh, thank you again for watching and you have a great day.